Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Neil Bauer uh, to a podcast. Uh, Neil uh, is a data scientist who started in a big way in real estate. Uh, his company, Multifamily U, uh, specializes in uh, educating uh, uh, you know all the multifamily clients, and he invests and uh, does syndications through his uh, other company. Uh, grow capitus welcome to the show neil thanks so much for having me on the show sakar very pleased to be here thank you thank you uh give us a a brief background neil as to how your career started from it side and now begin to real estate well i you know what happens with with a lot of technologists like me they they they, when they're in technology they're working 12 13 14 hours a day and they never really get a chance to get into real estate and so they start to dabble by buying a single family rental so if i was to line up a hundred technologists here probably 98 of them would say yeah i started with one single family rental well my story is not like that i actually started in reverse Mm -hmm. so uh, in 2003, my, ba- my boss, who was the CEO of the company that I was running, it was a technology education business that added healthcare education beyond t- after t- 2003, he asked me for help to build a campus from scratch. And this was basically a, a mixed use campus. It was half office and administrative and the other half was student. Mm-hmm. right? Not student housing, mm-hmm. but students to come in during the day, so classrooms. Sure. And it was an incredibly challenging project, Sakar. I mean, I, I was in, I was in absolutely terrified for nine straight months while we were building it that we would screw it up, not build it in time, get in trouble with the city, uh, get kicked out of our existing rental. July fourth, uh, two thousand four, was the last day that we were allowed to be in our building, and our our landlord hated us, so he never wanted to to. He would not even allow a single day's extension. So oh. imagine being terrified for nine months straight. Right. And and knowing that you were doing something that you had no competency in and no experience in. And that's what my state of mind was from September 2003 to July 2004. Right. But in hindsight, it was an incredible learning experience to be to be in charge of building something from scratch. That was a four and a half million dollar budget. And to be able to get involved in every nitty gritty to understand egress rules, air conditioning, airflow, fire codes, and 500 other things like that was incredible. And at the end of it, by the end of it, I was like, this is great. I just learned something of incredible value. And then I I, I urged my boss, as soon as we ran out of space two years later, let's build a bigger one. And so that one was 33,000 square foot. It was a building behind us, but we didn't have enough money to to actually buy and build that big of a space anymore because we'd already spent 4 million bucks two years earlier. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was we basically did what you now call Sakara syndication. True. I didn't even know that word for the next three years after we built this building that we were doing the syndication. So I broke, broke pretty much every rule of syndication that the SEC has ever written. Because I didn't simply know that something called syndication actually existed. We mm. just talked to a bunch of doctors here in Fremont, California. We're the home of Tesla. There were lots of lots and lots of doctors here as part of the Washington healthcare system. And we convinced them that we could take this big 33,000 shell building and build it out and chop it up into 2,000 square foot suites. Mm. And we would sell the suites to them so they would have a share. Mm. And then we would rent it back from them. Right? So the business would rent it back from them. Right. And when we started doing this, we were like, nobody is ever going to want to do this. This is the st- stupidest, dumbest idea of all that. It took us one day, Sakar, to sell out the whole project. Why? Mm-hmm. Because of something I, I know now that if you're doing an existing project, you charge a 2 to 3% acquisition fee. Right. And if you're doing a new construction project, you charge a 5% development fee. Sure. I didn't know that. We <laughs> didn't charge anything. We you built want- something from scratch for people and gifted it to them at cost. 
Sure. And so it got sold out in a day. And I was like, wow, I must be really smart. No, they were smart. They knew that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> they knew that they were getting something for free. And so everything got sold out. And then I rented it back from them as my business grew. So the experience of building that second campus, figuring out how to condominiumize office buildings, chop them up and do all of the CCNRs, do all the different documents to make sure that the association was set up and nobody was opening a strip club or a fitness club in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things, the learning was incredible. And eventually after that, I was like, you know, when I sell my technology business, this is what I'm going to do for a living. True, true. And uh, is that, I think I know a little bit of your background, uh, Neil, now, uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, is that kind of also gives you that confidence and rather that um, experience of new construction that now you feel that any new opportunity that comes, perhaps even if it's new construction, you can certainly take on uh, given the right metrics of submarket? Both yes and no. So I, I'm going to answer that question to say yes and no. I, mm -hmm. I've done, so I did multiple new construction projects in my past technology career. Mm -hmm. And I've built properties from scratch. I built a 102 unit apartment complex in Provo that's at a 100% occupancy for its apartments. And, and then I'm also building a six, $55 million dollar uh, new construction, 355 unit project in Buffalo. It's student mm -hmm. housing. It's next to the university. I so saw. while... I'm doing this, my answer to your question is still no, because what I have learned is that you may know how to do new construction, but new construction requires thousands of systems, processes, and checklists, mm -hmm. and, and very highly trained staff. So when I'm doing new opportunity zone projects where I'm building in Phoenix, I'm building in, in Oregon, I'm building in, um, in Utah, I am always working with a developer. But what's nice yeah. is that mm -hmm. he, they, they can never bullshit me, right? Because I've already mm -hmm. done four or five projects myself. So when they say yeah. silly stuff, I'm like, no, no, this is obviously wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pay a million for this. I'm going to pay, you know, 200,000. Yeah. So it helps greatly. But I absolutely work with developers because they have the project management staff and the systems and processes. I, I've started seeing uh, people in our syndication world mm -hmm. attempt to do new construction projects, especially in opportunity zones, which are extremely difficult. Sure. And Honestly, I have to tell you, Sakar, the word disaster is written all over these projects in, in large font. Because True. that is not, you cannot move from being a syndicator to a developer in one jump. It is not possible. True, true. I think there's a lot to learn and a lot of experience you need in new construction to pull off. And I think, as you indicated, that partnering with an uh, experienced developer is the way to go because you, uh, as a syndicator, you don't want to uh, risk the capital and, you know, uh, get a lesson on your back after two years or something. So, uh, Neil, uh, speaking of uh, different submarkets and uh, given the uh, this whole uh, sort of tangent of opportunity zones that we have, uh, how do you evaluate some of these submarkets? Um, like, you know, we know the key indicators and things like that. And where I'm going with this also Neil is that the Dallas, the Austin, the Orlando, these are all very hot markets and the amount of capital uh, that's available now, right? The, the prices are going very high. So what, uh, and I know so certain, um, uh, you know, key syndicators and operators are transitioning to some other cities where I think they see good value uh, that they can drive. So what, what is your methodology that how do you piece through uh, all of this uh, and select some of the cities uh, for your syndications? Firstly, I'm going to comment on what you just said. I do believe that the tier one metros are, are getting very bubbly. Now, I do not believe that this is a 2008 type bubble. I think that True. values can stay inflated for a significant amount of time mm -hmm. because the fundamentals, the underlying fundamentals of the economy are much stronger. We're not doing fraudulent loans. So the, the values may stay inflated for a significant amount of time. But I am... I'm an Indian. I'm very conservative by nature. I'm not willing to pay $100,000 a unit in Dallas or Fort Worth, right? So that that's mm -hmm. it. I, I may be I may be doing a property there, but it's it's going to be the exception to the norm, right? I'm not looking yeah. to cheap mm -hmm. properties. Mm -hmm. I love Orlando. I've been talking about it for three or four years. I'm, I should have jumped in three years ago when I knew it was an incredible opportunity. But but generally, I've, I'm finding tier one metros to be too expensive. And what I'm finding is. And I, I'm going to say something that 
you, you might just shut the whole podcast down right now. <laughs> it is my, my belief that in 2019, right? Let's not talk about what happened in the past because the past is the past. If you sure. invested, great. If you didn't invest, well, tough luck to you. But in 2019, the properties that are being purchased for syndication, mm -hmm. my belief is only 20% of them will hit performa. 20%. Mm -hmm. okay? and, and the reason and for that is, mm -hmm. is, is you've had 14 successive quarters of cap rate compression. So cap rates are going down, which means prices are going up. True. True. And you've also had interest rate basically increases, not necessarily in a straight line. So we've had a huge increase and then, then some, you know, an adjustment, but still an increase. And you might say, a lot of people tell me silly stuff like, well, Neil, it's only gone up, you know, from three and a half to four and a half, right? Yeah, or, or I would even say it's gone up from more like four to 4.75, right? Right. And people are like, that's only 0.75. Right. No, it's not please understand that the percentage difference between four and 4.75 is 30%. 4.75 is 30% higher, right? Or, sure. or almost 30%, almost 25% higher than four. So right. they've gone up 25%, True. Right? which is a big deal. A if big prices deal. go up 25, if, if interest rates go up 25% and prices go up 40%, your cumulative increase compared to three years ago is 70%. 80 percent right that True. so so i i doubt that there's an area in the united states where rents have gone up 80 percent in three years i don't think there's an area in the united states where rents have gone up 40 percent in three years right they True. might have gone up 20 percent in three years but the cumulative effect of interest rate increases and price increases is closer to 70 or 80 percent so when i see that and i see people still projecting you know the same 15 irr 16 irrs what they're doing is they're making the, fa the famous you know, fallacy, the famous assumption that the past is representative of the future. And sure. it's not. Mm -hmm. It is right. absolutely not. It is mathematically can be proven in 10 minutes that that is not the case. So when you're investing in these tier one metros, you're basically now being forced to assume the best in everything, the lowest, uh, you know, the highest income, the lowest expenses. You're, you're forced to assume that there's no recession coming in the next five years. There's all Completely. these assumptions. And, and if you don't make those assumptions, you right. are not going to win anything. I mean, there's, there's six to 10 offers on every property. If you're not making those assumptions, either you're a magician or you're not winning anything. There is no third case, right? I, th I believe that even the very good ones that are afraid of what's going on are still making those assumptions because otherwise they can't possibly be winning anything. My thesis is this whole concept of, I am buying these magical properties 20% below a market that nobody has access to is a fairy tale. It, it, that's very true. That's very true. And and that's why I asked that question, uh, Neil, that I'm glad you said all these things that the all the lot of syndicators are forced to come up with these rosy scenarios because that's the only way that they can make their magic Excel sheets work. You're absolutely right about that. And, and that's why I was asking that question is that the tier one series are so expensive that uh, people are forced to find value in, uh, you know, like secondary cities, like let's say Pittsburgh of the world and things like that. So uh, uh, how do you go about making sense out of it? And, and that was my second part of the question that, uh, how how are you finding the values series still? It's, it's got to be those uh, different indicators that you're perhaps looking at that uh, it's almost like nobody's looking at some of these cities and they have some uh, sense of curve that uh, some positive action that's happening. And uh, could you maybe share some thoughts on that, uh, Neil? Sure. But I, I think you're, once again, you might not like the answer that I give you. I mean, I am not, so... I'm a fiduciary of my investors' money. And sure. the word fiduciary implies that my real job is not to make them money. My real job is to protect their principle. True. That is what my job is. If I can make them money, good. But my first job is to protect their principle. Mm -hmm. So I take that part more seriously even than taking the, the making money part. And what I'm finding is that a lot of people, because they're frustrated with the tier one metros being so expensive, they're now going into underperforming metros. And mm -hmm. while there's some good metros out there on the underperformance side, a lot more of them are actually going into much rougher areas, areas mm -hmm. with no track record of growth. 
So mm -hmm. my feedback to the audience is simply this. Apply these five benchmarks and actually teach a free course on the internet. Anyone, anyone can watch it. It's incredibly powerful at udemy.com. That's U-D-E-M-Y.com mm -hmm. slash real focus. I'll, I'll type that in in here so you can you can you know have the exact URL up on the podcast page. Sure. Mm -hmm. Watch that because mm -hmm. fundamentally you want a certain minimum amount of population growth, a certain minimum amount of Sure. income growth, a certain minimum amount of home price growth, a reduction in crime, and a certain minimum amount of job growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you actually apply these five principles and have reasonable minimums, you, mm -hmm. what you don't want, you know, I, I, I hear people saying, well, you know, Pittsburgh, this part of Pittsburgh has, has population growth. But as a city, Pittsburgh has been losing population for decades. True. Right? Mm -hmm. So while it's true that certain parts of the city, especially the ones close to the Carnegie Mellon University, which mm -hmm. has a self-driving program that's doing really well, are, are gaining. True. But mm -hmm. as, as a fiduciary, I'm not looking to invest in cities that are losing population. So that reduces the... No I'm not saying that people are not making money there. Don't, don't take me true. to mean that, mm -hmm. that investors are all losing money there. No, there's mm -hmm. plenty of projects there that will do really, really well. Like cities, for example, that have been losing population very slowly, like Cincinnati or, or like mm -hmm. Cleveland, slow population loss. There's plenty of opportunities. People will make money. True. But my job as a fiduciary mm -hmm. is to basically say, I'm only going to invest where there's tailwind. So uh, this concept mm -hmm. of headwind and tailwind is very important to my investing. You True. know, a typical airplane flies at 500 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, when you look at the demographics, right, and go mm -hmm. into a metro that supports them, what you have is a 200 mile tailwind. What that means is the net speed of your air, airplane is not 500, it's 700. True. Right? True. Mm -hmm. When you're going into an area that has the worst demographics, let's say like Detroit or North St. Louis, True. you are now looking at a 200 mile headwind. Headwind. Well, now your right. aircraft is flying at 300, not 500. True. So the True. difference is 300 miles an hour or 700 miles an hour, right? Absolutely, so I, absolutely. I tend to ignore areas where the demographics are very sketchy, even though I know there's plenty of money to be made there and people are making plenty of money. So my approach is I want that minimum amount of population growth. I want that minimum amount of job growth. And whenever I do that, whenever I, I bought based on that, like Vegas, for example, right? Three years ago on these podcasts, if you Google my name, Neil Bauer on the internet and go back and watch some of my older stuff, you'll mm -hmm. notice this guy talks a lot about Vegas. He talks a lot about Provo, Utah, right? Did he mm -hmm. ever buy in Vegas? Yes. Did he ever buy in Provo, Utah? Yes. And when did he buy? Many years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Years and years and years ago. And now when you notice that on the job growth part, you know, charts today in 2019, Provo, Utah is always in the top 10 in the US out of, out of a thousand yeah. metros, right? And Las Vegas, which I was talking about three years ago and people were laughing at me. I went out and bought a $20 million project there. Las Vegas consistently for the last nine months is the number one rent growth metro in the United States. The only one that comes close to that is Sacramento. So when you look at those numbers, mm -hmm. right? Numbers don't lie. When nothing was build, being built in Clark County between 2008 and 2014, Mm -hmm. Clark County, which, which is the seat of Las Vegas, mm -hmm. was still the fastest growing county in the U.S. in terms of population. So when you have a county where thousands of new people from Los Angeles come in every year because they can't afford to live in L.A., right? right. But there's mm -hmm. no new construction of any kind, single family, multifamily, because it crashed and burned so hard. Eventually, right. you're going to create a supply-demand gap. And it right. took six years for it to build. And then after that, starting 2015 or late 2015, Vegas's rent started to accelerate. 1% a year growth, then 2%, then 4 then 6 Now we're at 8%. Wow. Right? Wow. And so that's Talk my feedback. The tailwind. <laughs> that, that's my feedback that go into metros that have tailwind. Now, tier 2 metros that have good tailwinds may not be names you've heard of, but I can't do anything about that. But I can right. tell you, these are metros with tailwind. Athens, Georgia is a metro mm -hmm. with tailwind. Dalton, Georgia is a metro with tailwind. Cape Coral, Fort Myers, Lehigh Acres, Provo, mm -hmm. Utah, Logan, Utah, uh, Ogden, Utah, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, Spokane, South Spokane, Idaho, Olympia, Washington. These are tier two metros that have mm -hmm. tailwind. Why? Because number one, capital is now flowing from their respective primaries. Olympia, okay. Mm -hmm. is gaining from Seattle's growth. I see. You know, Colorado Springs is gaining from, De from Denver's growth, right? So True. every one of these metros has a 
primary metro. Provo is benefiting from Salt Lake City becoming a tier one metro from a tier two metro. Recently got upgraded by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to a tier one up, uh, metro. So now you can go 75% uh, LTV on that mm-hmm. metro, right? Mm-hmm. Those things are important. Those, those are huge. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. Completely compressed. If you go from being able to do 65% debt to 75% debt in a market, immediately its cap rates are going to compress. And sure. guess what? Everything in a 50 mile radius is going to compress as well. But the sure. stuff in the 50 mile radius is not as expensive, True. right? True. So you can basically benefit from that. True. So in Provo, I wasn't even able to buy because there was nothing to buy. So I just built, I built 102 unit together with my partners. And it's been an incredible experience. So my feedback is there are tier two metros all around the United States. There aren't dozens of them. There are hundreds of them. And for people that are afraid that this cycle will end, there is no real estate cycle. There are 2,200 real estate cycles in the United States. True. And 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 multifamily. Some are early and some are late. Yeah, you know, yeah. New York is in the 10th inning of the cycle. You know, if you want to look at a nine inning baseball game on well, New York's in overtime, right? <laughs> whereas, whereas Vegas is in, still in the fourth inning because it didn't get started until 2016. Very true. Very true. And, and my, my comment also on that, uh, Neil, also is that multifamily being as insulated as it is, uh, you know, the delinquency and the default, uh, that protection that we always have. I mean, and earlier, as you said, rightfully, is that the loans are so properly written, underwritten now that the chances of a big uh, 2008, 2009 type of catastrophe we, uh, is, is probably not on the cards. It's just more of a slight correction, if any, that happens than a big uh, 2008 type of uh, catastrophe there. Um, so moving on, Neil, um, the, which, uh, during your asset management, which are the key performance indicators you manage uh, on a weekly or a monthly basis on, uh, around your team? A lot more than most people do. So I think that traditionally asset management has been, we do a 30 minute call with our property manager every single week. We sit mm-hmm. down, we have conversations with them. I'm finding that today it is, it's not getting me to my performa. It is just not happening because everything's priced to perfection. Even what I've been buying for the last two or three years is priced to perfection, right? I, I am not implying in any way that I have some magical off market access and I'm buying 20% below market, right? Because mm-hmm. that's just, the sales pitch, right? The truth is I am paying market, right? Even when I'm buying below market, most of the time, the big advantage I have is I don't have nine guys bidding against me, right? So I might be paying 3% under market. I mean, people who are saying I'm, I'm buying 3% on the marketing market are probably credible. The one that says 10 or 20% under market probably doesn't understand what he's buying. So when (laughs) I'm buying, you know, it's expensive stuff and, and it's becoming very difficult to just do a 30 minute meeting. As you know, I have an army in the Philippines that are virtual assistants, you know, I have 12 of them. Mm -hmm. And I'm using my VAs to look at a whole bunch of metrics and key performance indicators that we weren't looking at 18 months ago Mm -hmm. because we felt we didn't have to. But now Mm -hmm. we realize if you want to hit performa, we have to. So for example, I challenge everyone that's a syndicator that's watching to put his hand on his heart and say, I am actually tracking my delinquency statistics in such a way that I know how many exact average number of days it takes for my property manager to remove a tenant that is not paying. True. You know that True. number. Right. But, right. but here's the, the, the key thing. Let's say that it takes a month to evict people in your metro. You're in an awesome metro. It's very landlord friendly. It takes a month, right? right? Mm-hmm. But aren't you assuming that your property manager is doing it in a month? Have you actually looked to see the last 27 people that they evicted, I'm just going to pick a number, sure, sure, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. Have you done an analysis on that to see from the day that that tenant went delinquent, right? On the fifth right. of the month, he didn't pay. You posted the notice. He's delinquent now. Right. What was the day when he left? And what was the number of days that was different? What sure. I have found to my absolute shock is that unless you are really on top of the property manager with a delinquency based report or statistic, the average property manager is actually taking at least 50% more time than it should take. That's powerful. 50% and, is huge. We're talking yeah, massive NOI. That's, that's big. And, and another thing on that to add to insult, uh, I mean, add uh, insult to the injury there also, Neil, is that it's just not the delinquency. 
it's more also about you know when you're gonna turn over when you're gonna like paint and uh, re-rent the unit so you can start making the money so you got the delinquency you got the uh, you know turnover make ready costs and all your leasing and marketing so really when you're shifting that unit into bringing into as i call as income ready is still a lot more and i mean we experience that in our portfolio that you know we could be like advertising our units for a couple of months before you get it uh, rented so you're absolutely right that those uh, so what other metrics like delinquency would be one neil uh, sure anything? let me give you the second one you actually mentioned it a second ago right mm -hmm. so um you need to start tracking that from the num the day that the unit became empty mm -hmm. how many days actually took it for it to get rent ready and was that word rent ready real or fake sometimes i find that what what they mean by rent ready is they haven't even cleaned it up they've just finished basically doing the upgrades you know changing the floor sure. or whatever it is right so do you have a parameter there there do you have anybody do you have a virtual assistant basically with a tracker saying you know when a unit becomes empty on the fifth of the month it on average is taking them 13 days mm -hmm. to turn that unit if they're not upgrading it and it's taking them 19 days if they are upgrading i'm making these numbers up sure, sure, right sure. So, so firstly understand that because that is enormous amount of profit that is getting flushed down. I see too many people just focused on, oh, what is my economic occupancy? What is my physical occupancy? My physical is 95, my economic is 92, I'm fine. True. No, you're not fine. <laughs> because all of these hidden costs are what are really killing you. Your NOI is not gonna add up until you're looking at these metrics, right? True. So, True. so here's metric number one well, you know, which, uh, for this, which is, how many days does it take for him to turn the unit, right? And mm -hmm. then you need a metric for, from the day that he starts showing the unit for the first time, how many days do, on average does it take him to lease it up? True. What is the total number of days that mm -hmm. it takes for him to lease it up? Because once you're tracking these numbers, mm -hmm. you're gonna know if you have a good property manager or not. Until Absolutely. then, you can guess. Right, right, you're but just looking really, for the it's best. It's a bullshit now. guess. I mean, you don't actually know because True. you don't really know what he's doing. He might be saying to you, I'm at 92 or 93% occupancy. Here's True. another question, right? Um, I'm going to do some math here. So th mm -hmm. this one's a little dense. Sure. You have a 250 unit property. Mm -hmm. Okay. On average, let's assume your tenant lives uh, there for two years, right? right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that mean that 125 units, half of 250 are going to be empty each year? Right. True. True. So mm -hmm. if I divide that by months, that roughly means that ten and a half units are going to become empty every month. True. Right. True. Mm -hmm. So if ten and a half units become empty and you have four weeks in a month, doesn't that mean that just to stay at the exact same occupancy that you already are, not to grow, just to stay the same, sure. you have to rehab and turn two and a half units a week, ten and a half mm -hmm. units, four mm -hmm. weeks. So you have two and a half minutes a week. True. Well, mm -hmm. How many people are actually tracking to make sure that every week of the year, at least two and a half units are turned for a 250 unit property? Because if they're not, no matter how much demand you have, you could have people standing outside your door begging to let you let them in. You still are going to lose occupancy. True. Why? True. Because turns dictate the speed at which you lease. And because not enough people are looking at speed of turns, or we call a minimum acceptable benchmark of turns. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, here's what will happen when you start actually tracking this number, you're mm -hmm. gonna hit two and a half, then you're gonna hit two and a half, and then you're gonna hit one, and then two and a half, and then one, and then two and a half. So what will happen is your, your property manager will try to convince you that they're doing two and a half, but actually what they're doing is they're doing two and a half some weeks, True. then they're doing one or one and a half, but mm -hmm. to maintain your occupancy, you need to turn 10 and a half units a month, which means you have to do two and a half every week. And that's what True. people are not tracking. True, and, and also it gets so difficult that you have to have systems and procedures in place that, okay, what you're rehabbing, what colors, what carpet. I mean, you, you gotta have all that laid down so that it just becomes like, as soon as the turn happens, you're like doing it like clockwork, you know? Well, that, that's something that you have to do, Sakar, because right. you are managing your properties. In it, my it, properties, I have a property manager, so I focus on building systems to checkpoint everything that they're saying. True. On a call, if the property manager says, no problem, we're going to rehab three, three units a week. 
my job is not to go in and check to see if he has systems to do so. My job is to check to see he did rehab the through units. Right. And, and, and that's exactly and what I was, right. And that's yeah. exactly what I was getting at, Neil, is that making sure those systems are in place so that things are happening, basically. Now, uh, one last question, Neil. Speaking of uh, VAs, uh, you are a big fan uh, of uh, using uh, uh, VAs to do various tasks. Could you maybe uh, delve into details as to which parts of your business uh, you are giving to VAs and how you're leveraging uh, VAs to do different activities for your business? My, all parts. So, um, you know, we... We have virtual assistants doing every single part of our business because our inherent philosophy is that there's nothing magical about being an American, right? Mm -hmm. There are smart people everywhere in the world. True. And while a majority of the people that are working as virtual assistants on sites around the world, Upwork, online PH jobs, whatever the site is, a majority are unfortunately mediocre Mm -hmm. um, or at best. If you are willing to spend the recruiting time, which is an enormous amount of time that we spend, to separate the wheat from the chaff. So Mm -hmm. our rate is for every 250 profiles that we read on Upwork, we hire one employee. Wow. 250 Mm -hmm. to one. Now, and people are like, he's crazy. Nobody should need to do this. Mm -hmm. But let me supplement that by saying, but that one employee works for me for two years. Mm -hmm. I pay them six bucks an hour. And that Mm -hmm. one employee... I would put up against a mid-level U.S. employee any day of the week. Why? Right, right, because right. they're computer science graduates. They've worked on Upwork for five years. They've, they've worked with 50 employers. What person in wow. the U.S. can you hire that would work with 50 employers? Right. And they have a 100% job approval rating on Upwork. Those kinds of people are very hard to find. And then when you find them, they're already employed. So you have to chase them for a while. So... When we send requests to 250 people to interview every day, Mm -hmm. we only get 16 of them to actually agree out of 250. Mm -hmm. But if you do this all year round, Mm -hmm. you're going to get all 250 because sooner or later, their job will come to an end. So we are, we never stop recruiting. So, you know, when are we recruiting every day of the year? That's awesome. That's awesome. And so you, just a related follow up on that, Neil, then within your business, like how, how is your structure? Like meaning uh, what's your office staff like and your uh, VA staff like, like uh, how's, how's that divided? So our, our, our org chart is mm-hmm. divided into groups. So we have one team that's doing opportunity zone. So that's new construction, right? So, mm-hmm. and that team is all in the US. They have their own virtual assistants, but it's primarily a US based team. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have an operations team. We have a VP of operations. We have an operations manager. And then mm-hmm. the ops manager and everybody below them are all VAs. So everyone's a, a virtual assistant. We don't believe in part-timers. So sure. all of our VAs work 50 hour weeks and they all work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then some of them also work on Saturdays. Sure. So that ops group, does um, all of the value add things that we don't do that any that no other that we do that no other syndicator does? We they mm. generate twenty five thousand tenant leads a month. They do reputation calling. They do um, they do um, delinquency calls. Uh, they check accounting for all of our properties. Um, they they make sure that the weekly meetings with property managers are being held. Mm. Um, they help us write updates for investors. We we don't do quarterly updates for investors. We do monthly, and we do okay. photos and videos. They they help us gather those. Um, they help us do social media marketing so we can do outreach to investors. Mm. Uh, and of course, there's a there's a group of them that are helping us find properties. I see. So, I see. So there. I mean, as far as I know, there's no part of our company that isn't extremely heavily influenced Mm -hmm. by use of virtual assistants. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, uh, we use VAs uh, ourselves as well, but I I know you are such a force uh, using in so extensively. That's why I asked. And within your multifamily, you, which is the education arm as well, uh, I assume it's the same, like a lot of activities are also done by yep. VAs, uh, like especially the education webinars and all the graphics and things like that, I would imagine. All of that. I mean, if you look at multifamilyu.com, that's multifamily followed by the letter u.com, mm-hmm. you're immediately going to be struck by, oh my God, these guys do a hundred webinars a year. So in the last seven days, we've done four webinars mm-hmm. and those four webinars had about 2000 people enrolled. Wow. Right? 2,000 mm-hmm. people were enrolled in those webinars. 
Thanks. Everything from the graphics to the descriptions to the promotion to the sending out of the emails to the recruiting of those those uh, people to making sure that their mics were working and they were ready for the events the the um, the dry runs for the webinars all of it was handled by webinar by by our VAs and and was supervised by US based staff but our our model this year has changed where we have stopped thinking. U.S. staff has to supervise uh, Filipino staff. We've now okay. switched to a model where our managers are in the Philippines. So we prom started promoting managers and director level people in the Philippines. So even the people that are supervising are in the Philippines. I completely agree with you. Like someone who's talented and equally equipped can do lots of things. It's been a pleasure, Neil. I greatly appreciate uh, your insights. Uh, I would love to dig in into some separate topics as well, uh, perhaps at a future edition of our podcast. Uh, please uh, share with uh, everyone how they can uh, reach you. Well, I'm very available. So firstly, those 100 webinars a year that we do, these are on all sorts of different multifamily and single family topics. They're at multifamilyu.com. That's multifamily followed by the letter u.com. Um, my most popular demographic course, which is a mind blowing course, is at udemy.com. That's U-D-E-M-Y slash real focus. And anyone can send me an email at neal, that's N-E-A-L, that's the Irish spelling, N-E-A-L at uh, multifamilyu.com that goes directly to me. I read all of my email. You're welcome to to connect with me. Those are a few that are interested in passive investment. You know, you're welcome to come talk with me one on one, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we use demographics before purchase and how we use systems and virtual assistants after pur purchase to boost our returns. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Neil. And it's been a pleasure. You added such a great value in on the practical aspects of it. And listeners of the podcast can also reach uh, us at premiumcashflow.com where we always interview experts like Neil and many others on all kinds of topics uh, and uh, get into expert advice about different things. Uh, if you're interested also in passive investing, there are uh, opportunities available for different levels of investors. Uh, you can again reach us at premiumcashflow.com slash invest with us. So thank you, Neil. Um, I would love to chat again uh, in future. So I appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.